Good afternoon. <clears throat> My name is John Lindahl, and I'd like to welcome you to the Nebraska State Historical Society's Brown Bag Lecture Series, which is held here at the Museum of Nebraska History on the third Thursday of every month. A detailed schedule for this series, as well as information about all the Historical Society's programs and services, can be found on our website, which is nebraskahistory.org. Before I introduce today's speaker, I want to thank the Nebraska State Historical Society Foundation for funding the filming of these lectures. Their financial support allows us to tape and broadcast these programs on public access television. It's a real delight to have today's speaker, who is Paul Eisloffel, Nebraska State Historical Society audiovisual curator. Paul's topic is Nebraska's home movies, and he's here today to share how Nebraskans captured their lives on celluloid, beginning with the introduction of home movie formats and equipment in the 1920s. Please welcome Paul Eisloff. Thanks, John. Uh, is quite fitting to the topic. We have a nice intimate um, uh, venue today. Um, now, when it comes to movies, uh, theatrical feature films have gotten the lion's share of attention. But there are other significant aspects of America's cinematic history that have until recently been, you know, pretty much given short shrift. Genres like corporate and educational films, local television programs, advertisements, public service films, social training films, and others that have collectively amounted to more exposed celluloid than Hollywood ever produced. And one of these stepchildren of filmmaking activity has been particularly dismissed as so much trivial fluff, yet was created and still exists in great numbers and represents a vital historical record. And that is what we call home movies. Home movies are moving image records intended for showing to family, friends, and affinity groups rather than for public exhibition, says one glossary. Of course, we're breaking that rule today. Uh, they're also called family films or amateur films. They're generally made by non-professionals or hobbyists with no thought of profit, uh, and they're, they're motivated by the simple wish to record and perpetuate their lives and their times and their communities. But more than that, they're a unique form of personal communication, a means of human expression that selectively portrays how the creators chose to remember or to be remembered. And in this way, they're not unlike many other kinds of personal documents like diaries, correspondence, uh, that kind of thing. These all portray an editorialized version of life consistent with what the creator perceives is important for the audience of that document to know. But besides their comparative physical complexity, home movies differ from these other types of documents in that their intended audience is not just the creator or a single correspondent, but rather is a whole crowd, family and friends. Home movies are created for the familiar masses, falling somewhere between interpersonal and mass communication. Why are we so captivated by these kinds of images? Because home movies are a social and graphical throwback to which most of us can relate. They resonate with us on an almost instinctual level. There's something recognizable, familiar about them, even if they're not our own. We're willing to excuse the imperfections. In fact, we expect them. It's all part of the experience. The dimming of the lights, the flicker and rattle of the projector, the comfy seats, the good-natured heckling, these are all part of the ritual of home movies. This is a montage from our collection.
All Nebraska scenes, by the way, uh, except obviously that very last one. So today I'd like to share with you some of Nebraska's home movies, ones that we've collected here at the Nebraska State Historical Society and that are now part of our permanent collections. But first, a little background, because home movies are much more than just what they show. They're the result of a series of technological advances that have changed the way we document our lives and our world. Home movie technology grew out of two, grew out of two advances in particular, uh, both that started in the, the 1880s, and each of which is a long story in itself, which uh, I won't go into. But one was the introduction of snapshot photography. This not only made it possible for amateurs to practice photography, but at its heart was the flexible plastic film, uh, photographic film, that made movies possible. The other was the advent, uh, advent of motion picture photography itself. The second innovation was only possible after the first because of the flexible film that I mentioned to capture the individual images that are on film. Okay, so fast forward to 1923. In that year, Eastman Kodak Company introduced the first home movie outfit in America, the Cine Kodak. And here on, on the uh, left, you see a, uh, a picture uh, from the, the uh, manual for the Cine Kodak Model A. We actually have one of these in our collections here at the Historical Society. The camera was certainly small and simple, uh, you know, for, from cinematic standards, uh, but the big innovation here was the film itself. It was only 16 millimeters wide, about half inch or so. It was also called miniature or small gauge film. It was made from non-combustible plastic, uh, cellulose acetate, uh, dubbed safety film. This was actually a an innovation from the earlier part of the century. And you could load it in daylight. That was another innovation. But the best of all, it was reversal film, what they call reversal film. And that is the film exposed in the camera turned out positive rather than negative, uh, negating the need for uh, making uh, print from a negative like you had to do with uh, any other kind of motion picture film. Add to this the fact that this new technology was introduced to the public at a time of prosperity and increased affluence in America, and you have the makings of a popular craze. The home movie was born. Now, smaller cameras followed quickly, notably the Cine Kodak Model B in 1925, and on the right there, there's an ad for, for that from 1927. Other manufacturers begin, began getting into the game, too. Some of you may have heard of DeVry, Bell & Howell, Revere, uh, Victor, and some others. As you can imagine, the marketing came fast and furious. Here on the left is a Kodak ad from 1924, which uh, recycled their, uh, the company's own brilliant tagline that they use for their snapshot cameras. You press the button, we do the rest. Other ads called home movies a brilliant adaptation of the cinema to fit the family. Brings to your household an unlimited source of new and healthy pleasures. Each of these films is a fragment of life, comic, poignant, or instructive as you choose. The ad on the right for the Victor Company, which is actually from uh, Davenport, Iowa, based in Davenport, calls them motion picture port portraits, life's only replica. Fast forward again from the 20s to the 1930s. The drive to make things more convenient and more economical to the public, and therefore make gobs of money for the manufacturers, brought about the 8 millimeter format with frames a quarter the size of the 16 millimeter frames. The 1930s also saw the introduction of Kodachrome, the first successful amateur color movie film. By this time, home movie making was fairly well advanced. There were several manufacturers of cameras and projectors, but more than that, 
There were all the trappings of a serious hobby, even in avocation, S supported by the availability of editing equipment, as seen here in this Sears catalog spread, how-to literature like this book over here, How to Make Good Movies, which first appeared in 1938, and uh, clubs that were local and, uh, and national. Okay, fast forward again to the 1960s. <coughs> From the 1930s to the 1960s, home movie technology pretty much remained the same. But in 1965, Super 8 film and equipment was introduced with drop-in cartridges and increased image area of 50% over standard 8 millimeter. And then in 1973, as you see here in the lower, lower right, Kodak came out with its Ektasound system, the first practical sound on film format for the amateur movie maker. But even these innovations weren't enough to save the home movie, on film that is, uh, from the coming of videotape. Now, 8mm and 16mm pretty much exist in archival repositories like ours, and in the hands of a relative few avant-garde small gauge filmmakers who still pay homage to the tactile qualities of real filmmaking. So that all sets up the context. Now let's enjoy some Nebraska home movies. I'll start with the earliest first. Oops, I'm sorry, get back. This is part of a promotional film made for the benefit of Cotner College in 1923. The very year the 16 millimeter home movie film format became available to the public. This is likely among the first 16 millimeter films shot in Nebraska, and it's certainly the earliest in our collections. Cotner College was here in Lincoln, in the Bethany area, uh, affiliated with the Disciples of Christ, and um, was founded in 1889 and held classes up through 1933. I guess the promotion didn't quite, didn't quite work, but they used this for uh, recruiting students uh, to the university college. Now what makes this film special besides its date is that it was made in the brand new amateur format, but wasn't a home movie per se. Rather, it was, like I say, a promotional film. And this is another thing about the home movie format. Moving images had long been used for teaching and for advertising, but the advent of 16 millimeter allowed non-professionals to create uh, films for educational and promotional purposes. Next, we have an example of home movies proper. These from a fam the family of Lincoln orchestra leader and music store owner, Edward Walt. Mr. Walt purchased a Kodak camera not too long after they hit the market and began a family tradition of amateur filmmaking that lasted well into the 1950s. And this is what we often see is, uh, is these long spans of, uh, of family family images that really show the, uh, you know, the birth of family members and them growing up and so forth. These clips are from his earliest reel, 1925. It shows family and community scenes typical of home movie photography, friends, relatives, lots of mugging for the camera. You notice that the photographer really made good use of, of, of uh, motion. 
Uh, two scenes particularly special, <coughs> views of the construction of the groundbreaking Nebraska State Capitol building. including the K Street Railway here that was built to bring uh, materials to the construction site from the rail yards. This is the first, uh, the only moving image uh, that we have of that, I believe. And a shot of a photographer snapping a portrait with a large format still camera, sort of art imitating art or life or whatever. It's kind of sort of backwards there. This next amateur film takes the special event aspect of the home movie genre and wraps a whole film around it. You know, as uh, a lot of home movies will have not just, you know, family and friends or whatever, but they'll, they'll sort of be wrapped around a, a particular event and uh, document it that way. Uh, this is a 1929 air tour around the state of Nebraska. Numerous pilots and aircraft took part, taking off and landing from airstrips scattered throughout the southern, central, and eastern part of the state. Tour started in Omaha. Here you see Falls City. And that, uh, that writing of the name Falls City that you saw in the building was for the benefit of aviators and also pointed to Magnetic North. You saw a circle there with a line for navigation purposes. You notice also that the airfields are, are grass covered. Uh, nothing like tarmac in those days. There you get an idea of, of the, the crowds that came, came out for particular uh, landings and so forth. back to Omaha at the end. Now we don't know who shot that footage, uh, but what's special about it is that it shows the strong connection between two phenomena popular uh, to the day, that is popular aviation and home movie photography, both of which grew up in the 1920s. Auto touring, railroading, <coughs> really any kind of travel were also frequent uh, subjects of home movies. These next clips, also from 1929, are from a collection of reels shot by Jesse Avery, a farmer who lived outside of Humboldt in rural Richardson County, Nebraska. This is the Missouri River Ferry um, near Brownville, the sole means of crossing to Iowa by auto before more bridges span the river. Someone forgot to open the gate. You know, uh, kids and pets were really, 
really popular subjects for home movies. Now this is uh, corn husking. a really good record, actually, of corn husking. We also have footage in our collections of uh, husking bees that were, you know, that were uh, uh, contests even on a national level. Avery excelled in moving image portraits of families and friends. He put a real human face on the rural life he documents. is a cat that does not want to be held. Another person who immortalized his family in home movies, uh, George Wentz of Lincoln. Uh, Wentz was president of a plumbing and heating company that bore his name, and he shot scenes in Lincoln like these of Epworth. Hepworth uh, Lake. And then here's uh, some scenes at Toadstool Park in the northwest corner of the state. Uh, Wentz clearly enjoyed auto touring. As I mentioned before, this was uh, kind of a recurring theme in home movies and combined that with his home movie acumen. Staying in that part of the state a bit longer, this next film was shot on 8 millimeter film, which became available, as I said before, in 1932. This is a short reel, only 50 feet in length, about 8 minutes long in all. But there's a lot packed into those 50, 50 feet. The occasion captured was billed as the last great gathering of the Sioux Nation, September 1934, in Crawford, Nebraska. It was shot by Crawford residents Arthur Howe, who was a pharmacist. Now, a little trivia that taps into the fact that drugstores were the frequent conduits between the photographers and the labs that developed their film. You take them into the drugstore, they send them to the lab, just like you know, uh, you would do, take uh, you know, roll film to uh, Walgreens if anyone uses that anymore, and uh, get the images back. This event was held in conjunction with the dedication of the twin monuments at Fort Robinson to the memories of Lieutenant Levi Robinson and Oglala Chief Crazy Horse. And these scenes represent some of the, some of the society's best moving image footage of Native Americans. In fact, uh, there's a national project underway to, uh, to showcase a uh, few choice uh, home movies and collections across the country, and this has been chosen for one of them. These next clips are also from the Nebraska Panhandle and were also captured on 8 millimeter film. And like the last one, it documents specific events. Uh, rather than the more random filmmaking usually associated with home movies. This one, though, captures events that happen over a period of time, thus documenting a long process. And it has the added dimension of color, uh, which you'll see in a minute, mixed in with black and white. There's some color footage. 
The film was shot and edited by Glenn Kellett, who together with his brother Leo, farmed 80 acres of land in Nebraska's North Platte Valley near the towns of Gehring and Scotts Bluff. During the late 1930s and early 40s, Kellett produced six 8mm films of their farming operations, and in his films, he deliberately follows the production of various crops from planting through harvest and preparation for market. They track the life cycle of specific crops, sugar beets, uh, potatoes, field beans, corn, and alfalfa. Some great sugar beet shots here, and we, you know, we don't have any other moving images quite like these um, that show that the production of that crop. So in each reel, Kellett splices together shots made throughout the season, probably actually over a couple of seasons. And so they're kind of like mini documentaries, but they still retain that personal touch. From his last reel, uh, Kellett chronicles the building of a modern dairy barn. And this was a, an interesting design, uh, actually like an inverted, the, the hull of a ship, inverted and uh, was a design that, uh, that uh, in part was developed here at the University of Nebraska in the, uh, in the Ag College. So you talk about a barn raising. This is this is a pretty spe uh, specialized one. Now back to Lincoln. These next clips are from amateur footage shot for the Uni University of Nebraska. Pardon me. Uh, the gym men's gymnastic program there. This is around 1935. Like the first film we saw, the Kottner College film, this footage was instructional in purpose. It captured the proper execution of you know particular uh, gymnastic routines. And what better technology for, for that purpose than moving images? This just wouldn't be the same in any other form of documentation. In a way, these clips are a direct descendant of Edward Mybridge's motion studies of the late 1880s. Uh, you know, they've seen the galloping horse and that sort of thing. Uh, the true precursor of photographic moving images. And of course, if you've been watching the Olympics, you know that these are actually pretty primitive routines, but at the time they were state of the art. In fact, this was just about the time that the men's gymnastic program at, at uh, the university was really taking off and getting some national attention. You notice that it's kind of in slow motion, and that was, that was shot you know, specifically on purpose to make it more of an instructional kind of, kind of thing. Finally, some shots from Brownville native Frank Thomas, who deftly documented the process of cutting ice from the Missouri River in 1940. Again, kind of a bit of documentary filmmaking on the amateur level, rather than the, you know, typ more typical family events kinds of kinds of scenes.
all of these photographers we've seen um, have uh, show uh, kind of an artistic um, uh, talent that you don't see, of course, in, in every home movie. And all untrained in the, in the genre. So what's happening with vintage home movies these days? Well, the whole genre is now a hot topic of scholarly exploration from technical, cultural, and sociological points of view. They're increasing, increasingly sought after by documentary filmmakers and other media producers because they are so unique and personal views of the world. And by their very nature, you know, what I said about reversal film, there's not a negative, there's only the positive. It's uh, by their very nature, they're one of a kind. Preservation efforts uh, are now supported by granting agencies. In fact, uh, uh, most of the clips you've seen today have benefited from grant funds, mostly from the National Film Preservation Foundation. And happily, there are increased efforts by archives, museums, and libraries to collect and preserve home movies. Some home movies have even been named to the Library of Congress's National Film Registry along, alongside such popular and esteemed classics as Citizen Kane and Star Wars. One of the most remarkable evidences of the newfound interest in home movies is Home Movie Day, a yearly celebration of amateur filmmaking. This grassroots tribute grew out of the desires of a handful of archivists and filmmakers and exhibitors to showcase the home movie genre. Home Movie Day started as a grass, that grassroots effort um, and since, um, that was five years ago, and since the event has grown to fill a worldwide slate of venues uh, in Japan, Italy, uh, as well as all over the United States. This year's global event is slated for October 18th. Prior to this, it was always held on, um, on August 16th uh, because the date is 8-16 uh, as, as a tip of the hat to 8 millimeter and 16 millimeter. This is the first year they're varying from that. So in short, the home movie genre is finally taking its rightful place in the history of American and world cinematic activity. And none too soon, I think you'll agree, having seen some of the cap captivating and unique images from our own state. What you've seen today is just the tip of a very big iceberg uh, that is our moving image collections. The Nebraska State Historical Society's collections contain around 25,000 reels of motion, motion picture film. We estimate about 22 million feet, and a good 15% or so of those are home movies or amateur-made films. Hope you've enjoyed them. Thank you very much for coming today. Are there any questions or comments? Yes, Ann. Well, I've got two, actually two questions. One, um, was it a fairly expensive hobby to have? Um, and then the second one is, you know, most of them that we saw today are outside. And, and I guess that makes sense because uh, inside lighting, I assume, was not adequate for a lot of home <coughs> movies, but was there a point at which you started seeing more inside home movies? Well, the, um, as to whether it was affordable or not, uh, you usually see people with more expendable income uh, making home movies, uh, like George Wentz, who owned a company and, and so forth. One of the anomalies uh, to that in these examples was uh, Jesse Avery, who was a farmer. Um, but dedicated in, in, to, to a degree, a very large degree, to the, to the hobby. Um, 
it was the intent of the manufacturers to, to keep it affordable, but it was definitely, especially when you got into the Depression era and so forth, definitely something that was, uh, you know, confined to a relative few. Uh, however, it was very widespread in that, you know, it was in all the Sears catalogs, Montgomery Ward catalogs, and so forth. Your second question about indoor versus outdoor scenes is, as you say, is because of lighting. Uh, however, when they, the manufacturers really started coming out with these, you know, support pieces of, of equipment, um, like titlers and various things like that, and you saw some examples of the inner titles that you could make as a, as a hobbyist, um, lights were included in that. So you started to see a little more inside stuff, but I think uh, generally they didn't turn out all that well. In my experience from watching these things, they were, you know, very hot spot type thing and then, and then a lot of shadows and so forth. Um, but uh, they did their best, especially at like Christmas time and so forth, because those were, those were one of those big family events. Um, one thing about the family events is that you usually don't see, you don't see common things. You don't see like just a meal, but you'll see a holiday meal, you'll see a picnic, you know, things like that that sort of are infused with this not routine but special version of, uh, of the same thing. So there, we do have a lot of, uh, and home movies in general, have a lot of Christmas things, you know, trains around the tree, unwrapping gifts and so forth. Um, but yeah, that, that was one of the, one of the uh, support pieces of equipment that came out pretty quickly. John, yeah, oh, okay. I have some home movies from the late 20s and early 30s. I see yours are in canisters, metal canisters. So are mine. Is that the best way to store them and keep them? Actually, <laughs> well, uh, environment is, is probably the, the number one issue of uh, cool and dry and not a lot of uh, fluctuations in that. Uh, film should be stored ho horizontally. Um, another thing about films um, is, um, is the off-gassing. Even though this was uh, considered safety film, it was safety film in that it wasn't, um, wasn't combustible like uh, nitrate film was. Um, but it had its own chemical problems. Uh, and in fact, if you open those cans that you've got, you'll probably get this strong odor of that's a vinegary kind of odor. And that's, uh, that's called uh, vinegar syndrome. It's actually acid hydrolysis. And it's, uh, it's moisture in the air uh, reacting with the plastic, uh, the acetate plastic. And that will just continue to degrade the film. Um, so because of that gas, it's, uh, it's particularly important to um, store, can, store films in vented cans and have good air exchange. So that's what we try to achieve in archives. Um, you might consider donating your films to archive, to an archive that would, um, that collects the, the kinds of things that are, that are evidenced in your home movies. Uh, because they're generally better equipped to store things properly. Um, you should also avoid um, projecting them, even if you have an old projector, um, because the, the projection process is pretty difficult on film, especially old film. There are a lot of websites these days, publications, but also websites that keep more current than the publications that relate to, uh, you know, what, what to do right by your home movies. Thank you. Yes, John. Can you receive these donations? Are you transferring with DVDs? Or? Well, yeah, we, we do. Um, 
we do transfer these to um, other media. Uh, as you can imagine, it's, it's hard to provide access to the images. These are what you call machine-dependent documents, or as any audiovisual documents are, sound recordings uh, included. And so you have to have the interface between the uh, uh, a mechanical or electronic interface between the document and the user. And uh, because the, the machines can, well, they're harder to find, for one thing. In fact, even a lot of ubiquitous uh, video formats are, you can't even get equipment anymore. It's not being manufactured anymore, I should say. Um, or, nor is the tape. Um, but uh, that's why we reformat uh, moving images in our collections. It's, a, it's kind of a long and expensive process, so we're, we're just whittling away slowly on that and trying to isolate the kind of the best stuff we have, you know, and, and, uh, and getting that available. Other than that, it's more of an on-demand thing. If uh, someone contacts us and wants, is looking for certain scenes, uh, then we can, you know, do that with the, with the particular film they're interested in. Yes, and I should point out that there are a lot of services that will transfer your home movies. But if you do that, do not get rid of the original films. They will last much longer than any kind of reformat, uh, uh, reformatting w will, including DVD. Is yes, John? Is process of transferring you lose uh, quality, quality? Well, yeah, I think you do lose some quality when you transfer film. Now, of course, there's HD uh, transfers. That is pretty expensive and is... Uh, is confined to labs that have made huge investments in in equipment, um, but I think that there's um, it's pretty much universally uh, believed that nothing beats light going through the silver particles of of motion picture film, and that um, that a digital or even analog uh, video format is just not going to pick that up. But our, our, uh, our desire is mainly to provide access to the content of these things. So, um, so that's what we strive to do. Yes, ma'am? Would color deteriorate faster than black and white? Uh, color deteriorating faster, actually, no. There was a before ectochrome, uh, there was, um, I mean, before Kodachrome, there was Ektachrome uh, that started in the 1920s, a disaster. It, uh, the, the dyes used in it just faded very quickly. Um, Ektachrome, Kodachrome, I'm sorry, um, will remain pretty vibrant if stored in proper conditions. We've probably all seen films that have, you know, turned kind of a magenta color, um, and those that's because the uh, the blue and the yellow dyes tend to tend to uh, go away first, leaving the magenta. Uh, so they do t deteriorate, especially ones that have been. Um, and this doesn't uh, really account for home movies so much, but. Films that were in libraries and so forth and media centers that you could rent out and you saw in schools and stuff like that. They got a lot of use, a lot of abuse, and uh, the colors didn't stand up to that kind of abuse. But home movies, you know, that don't get that much play and pretty much are in the dark, you know, a good part of the time, those, those have remained pretty vibrant. I've, I've just been amazed at things I've seen from the 1930s on 8 millimeter. It's like, wow, you know, it's, it's amazing. Well, again, I thank you all for coming. and. Uh,
pull out those video cameras, see if you can match some of the stuff that we saw today. Thank you.